John Leonard from Wild Cornell Medicine and New York Presbyterian Hospital in New York. Follicular lymphoma is roughly the second most common type of lymphoma. It's the most common of the indolent or slow growing types of lymphoma. So the key things about follicular lymphoma are that it is something that people live with. They typically do not die from it, although uh, unfortunately sometimes uh, it can be a life-threatening problem. But it is something that's typically managed over many years, over many decades. I tend to call it like a hitchhiker lymphoma that we try to keep in the trunk of the car and keep it quiet so the, people, the patient can live as normal a life as possible. Most people with follicular lymphoma feel relatively well. The most common way that patients present themselves with follicular lymphoma, like with most lymphomas, is with a swollen lymph node. They feel a gland in their neck, under their arms, in their groin. Maybe their doctor feels it on an exam. Maybe it pops up in some sort of imaging test, like a CAT scan or a chest X-ray that's done for other reasons. Sometimes it causes other symptoms, swelling or other complaints that bring it to the patient's and the doctor's attention. And occasionally it manifests itself in the blood counts or on some lab test that leads to further investigation and making the diagnosis. Someone who has a swollen lymph node uh, really has a long list of what could give that lymph node to be enlarged. Most commonly across the board, it's infection or it's inflammation of some sort or another, uh, or in less common cases, uh, some sort of, of tumor. Um, ultimately, it kind of depends on the whole picture, the patient seeing the doctor, the doctor taking a history, doing some laboratory tests, doing a physical examination to say, is it only that one lymph node? Is it in other places? And what else is going on with the person to sort it through? That would then lead to uh, laboratory tests of various types. And then in some cases, it would lead to a biopsy. In some cases, if there was an infection or an inflammation going on, it might lead to other testing or treatments. Sometimes we just watch it and see if it goes away. Um, but for a lymphoma patient, usually it uh, has a more complicated picture or it lasts a while and that leads to a biopsy in most cases. There are a number of different frontline or initial treatments for patients with follicular lymphoma. Most patients with follicular lymphoma have it in a number of different areas. Most lymphomas are not just in one place. They tend to be as in the family of blood cancer spread to different areas. On occasion, we do have a patient that has it in just one pa place after we do all the testing. And in those cases, while we sometimes watch it, often we'll do radiation to that local area, and that can have a very good long-term result for the patient. Most patients have lymphoma and follicular lymphoma in multiple places. And so really what decides how you approach it uh, is dependent on a number of different factors, how the person is feeling, uh, how big the lymph nodes are, where they are, what other issues are going on, what the symptoms are. Sometimes we just watch it because it turns out that many of these patients can do very well long-term and in fact often have a normal life expectancy even with not getting initial treatment right away, which is kind of a strange thing to think about in cancer, but it's something that because long-term outlook tends to be good, uh, patients can do well without any treatment. Those who need treatment, whether at the time of diagnosis or at some point later, can be treated with what we call immunotherapy or antibody therapy. The most common of those is called rituximab, but there are various others. Sometimes people are treated with chemotherapy plus rituximab, and there are a couple of different choices that patients have. So those are the most common initial treatment choices that patients receive. Patients who have relapsed or refractory lymphoma, meaning that the lymphoma got some treatment, it went away, it improved, and it either came back later or in the less common cases, the initial treatment didn't work well at all. Those are patients where we kind of go through the same list of options. Sometimes we'll just watch the, the disease, the patient's feeling well, not causing any problems. We might just watch it and monitor it. Uh, other times we'll do some of the same treatments. We can use rituximab again. We can use 
uh, chemotherapy with rituximab. There are also, in relapse patients, a number of other options that we might use. There's a newer version of rituximab called obinutuzumab. Sometimes we use that. There are a family of other drugs um, that we sometimes use, depending on the situation. One of those is lenalidomide, which is a pill, and that can be used typically with rituximab to try to make that work better. There are other chemotherapy drugs, depending on what the patient had before. There's a drug called tazemetostat, another pill that works in different ways. And then we have newer immunotherapies like what are called bispecific antibodies, new types of immunotherapies, and even CAR T cells, which is an even newer uh, type of treatment that is a little more complicated. So there are lots of different options, so that's good news for patients, uh, but it can be complicated to decide, and it really depends on the individual situation, which one might be chosen. The good news for patients with follicular lymphoma is that outcomes are improving. Uh, we have lots and lots of information that patients are living longer with follicular lymphoma than compared to even 10 or 20 years ago. And I think that's good news because uh, I expect that patients will continue to have an improved prognosis, meaning someone diagnosed today will be likely to do better, or a group of patients diagnosed today will be likely to do better than patients even did in the past. That is, I think, in large part due to some of these new treatments. And um, really what the new treatments in any situation in, in tumors and cancer, we tend to start those new treatments in patients where the other treatments have stopped working or didn't work well, kind of as what we call later line therapies, as a third, fourth, fifth treatment when patients might have fewer options. When we can show that these drugs work in patients where the other treatments stopped working, then it gets us excited because we can say, well, if it works when the, uh, the initial treatments didn't work so well, maybe we should use these new treatments as initial treatment. And so more and more we're taking treatments that were approved and developed as kind of later line or uh, later options and saying, well, if they're so good there, maybe we can use them earlier. So that's why clinical trials that are exploring these options and these new approaches earlier in the course of treatment are really important. So two points I would make about life expectancy in follicular lymphoma. Everyone with follicular lymphoma doesn't have a normal life expectancy, but most people do, meaning there are exceptions to that. So I don't want to minimize the problem. It is a problem. Most people can expect a normal life expectancy, but we still have work to do and progress to make. And for some people, it can be a life-threatening thing. The second part of your question really relates to, is follicular lymphoma curable? It's a very hard thing to kind of understand because follicular lymphoma can come back 20 years later. And so you get into these semantics, you get into the philosophy of if you die of something else before your follicular lymphoma comes back, then maybe that's okay. Now, if you're young or even if you're older, you might not be excited about dying at all, obviously. But there are many patients who die of something else, live a normal life expectancy, when in, and in old age die of something else, and the follicular lymphoma, again, is either there but quiet or not even there as best we can tell. So that gets into then how important is it to entirely get rid of the follicular lymphoma, and we'd all like to get rid of it, but it's hard to prove in an individual patient that for you, we actually got rid of it because we have to wait a long time and we have to say, see how it all plays out because we don't really get to a point where we say, oh, we've made it to some landmark, some period, you're home free. Um, so that being said, I think many people can do quite well. And I think that we do definitely cure some people with follicular lymphoma by any definition you want to make. It's just hard to say to an individual patient, you are cured because we have to wait a long time to see what happens. The Lymphoma Research Foundation is a wonderful resource for patients newly diagnosed or uh, relapsed, with relapsed lymphoma. It's also a great resource for caregivers and, and others supporting those with the disease. I think it, it really falls into a number of different phases. One is certainly education. 
And every patient that I see, newly diagnosed or relapsed, the first time I see them, I give them the books from the Lymphoma Research Foundation that describe uh, the background that they need to know for lymphoma, and I'm happy to have participated in actually developing those books because I think they're a great resource. Lymphoma is com confusing. It's very confusing for doctors and, so, uh, and patients, and the LRF is a great resource to try to tease out all of that complexity. There are also lots of support programs that LRF does. They really are uh, available on the website in different educational programs that they have as new treatments come out, new information comes out. Uh, again, an important resource for patients uh, over time. And I think that's, that's really wonderful. There's great support for caregivers. The job of a caregiver obviously is supporting and understanding lymphoma, but also understanding the needs beyond things like treatment, but what other support patients have, social needs, um, psychological support, other things that really play into to patients' quality of life and how they're able to live and cope with the disease. LRF is really important for advocacy. It's out there advocating for patients with lymphoma and their families to try to in, tackle the problems that are facing lymphoma patients, whether it be research, whether it's uh, governmental issues, insurance issues, other things about getting drugs approved, things that patients need, and so the advocacy is really important. And then finally, the research support that LRF does and all of the new things, every time a doctor talks to a patient and their family about their disease, it's because of research. It's because uh, we've done studies, we've learned about new drugs, developed new drugs, understood information about lymphoma, and the LRF is a wonderful supporter of research in many different ways. I'm happy to be uh, really a, a part of LRF. It's done wonderful things for patients and it's really a great place to get information, to be part of the lymphoma community and uh, really make things better for lymphoma patients and their, and their families. Mm -hmm.